Walk and Talk podcast now sweetened by Noble Citrus. Bite into a juicy crunch tangerine. 40 years perfected. Seedless and oh so tasty. Or savor a starburst pomelo. The giant citrus with a unique zing. Don't miss autumn honey tangerines. Big and easy to peel. Noble. Generations of citrus expertise delivering exceptional flavor year round. Taste the difference with Noble Citrus. Food fam, this is the Walk and Talk podcast, where you will find the perfect blend of food, fun, and cooking knowledge. I'm your host, Carl Fiadini. Welcome to the number one food podcast in the country. We are podcasting on site at Ibis Images Studios, where food photography comes alive and I get to eat it. All right, first things first. Last week we did a remix on the fabled Monte Cristo. Ah. Uh, My goodness, I was not disappointed. I had dreams about that sandwich for days, literally. Like, even today, hallucinations. I don't understand. Uh, Be sure to check out our Instagram, LinkedIn, and uh, Facebook uh, to get eyeballs on the the beautiful, beautiful photography uh, by John. Um, You'll find the handles in the description. All right, so what do you call a... What do you call a pig that knows karate? Yeah, that's right, a pork chop. Okay, okay, okay. On with the menu today. Obviously, we're still focused on pork, uh, and that is the pork chops, baby. Uh, I'm excited about uh, trying Jefferson's take on the classic country fried steak, um, which is, of course, in the pork chop form. Um, He's got three other elevated uh, badass dishes that um, he's going to get into. Uh, Peninsula Food Service. Thank you kindly for supplying the proteins for today's Producciones. Uh, chefs in the Central Florida area, uh, Peninsula is the largest distributor of Creekstone Farms beef in the Southeast United States. Uh, complete with a fully staffed butcher shop to help you solve your kitchen inconsistencies. Check out their dry age program, too. You won't be disappointed. Uh, chefs, seriously, like uh, Orlando, Tampa, Sarasota, get on the phone. Uh, our guest this week is New Orleans-based author, food explorer, and writer Matt Haynes. Uh, you've seen his content in national publications such as CNN, New York Times, and Zagat. He's the author of The Big Book of King Cakes and The Little Book of King Cakes. Uh, Matt Haynes is on deck. Jeff, pop the clutch. Slam to that pre-shift, baby. Let's get the uh, dish explanations uh, out for the audience. Almost perfect with that. Right? Almost. Almost there. <sighs> Look at that. Silent John came through with it. Don't almost. judge me. Don't we, there's dare a bunch you. of judging, bro. <laughs> judge said, me. That's all we do here. Wanna, you know what? Next next week, you read this. Let me see how you do it. The, I'll mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll be. I'll, I'll own it. <laughs> you have a new nickname. It'll be Stumbling Jeff. Yeah, okay? Probably. All right. Okay. I love you, baby. So what do we, Man, I, man I, pork chops. <sighs> I mean, you got the big game coming around the corner, so I still wanted to stay on track with that. And there's, you can do, I guess, three of the... Now, two of the four I did, you could definitely do on the grill. One of them you got to do in the fryer. But, man, there's nothing like taking that country fried steak and doing something really nice to it. And just having that, you know, marination of buttermilk and some of the ranch packet dressing, if you want to call it that. Just get in there and let it marinate for two days. That buttermilk permeates that meat. It was so tender. It was just unbelievable. Then he had a little bit of the haricot vert instead of doing it, the regular wax green beans, and then elevating the mashed potatoes up with a little bit of the roasted garlic and a little bit of sour cream. Um, haricot vert. So that's uh, otherwise known as a French green bean. Yes. Just yeah. for the people out there. <laughs> yeah. So the the other three that we did, um, one I did, I wanted to do a little bit more Asian-esque. So I did some miso, sake, black garlic, and I pureed that up. And then I had, I totally forgot about these, um, in the back of the refrigerator, like everybody else, I had fermented cherries that were fermented with bullet bourbon. So I added some of the the liquid to that and some of the cherries for a different tang or a little bit of flavor profile there. And then uh, we did uh, a rendition, man, that noble, juicy crunch, tangerine. I can't stop talking about it. Yeah, no, Quentin does a that farm. <sighs> they do a fantastic job. And there's only 45 days, and then you can't get them. So every time I'm going to certain markets, I'm finding them and making this beautiful marmalade. And it's got basically uh, vanilla, bourbon, cardamom, 
tangerine, the juicy crunch. I rendered that down or cooked it down for about almost an hour. Got it really nice and thick. Glazed the pork chop that way. Put it with some fennel and, or as some of our <laughs> listeners might call it, fennel. Um, mm. And then fennel and apple, Granny Smith apple for tartness. That was a little slaw. No mayonnaise. Did um, some pecans crunched up in there too for some texture. And then I did a blue masa corn flour corn uh, bread. And then I infused that with some fun or actually white cheddar cheese from England, uh, the white coastal cheddar, which is one of my favorites. But I didn't do it normal. So when you see these beautiful shots that John did, um, I have this mold that looks like a cylindrical ball and it has little divots in it. And we filled those divots with the uh, marmalade, then some fennel tops. Gorgeous shot. I can't wait for you guys to see that. And then lastly, I paid homage to a really, really great uh, family that got me started. Um, Teddy Andriozzi, Teddy Falco, uh, they were an uncle and nephew uh, duo. They own Pastanache down in Miami Beach, North Miami Beach, right uh, past 163rd. And when the state widened the road, they had to sell their property. And then he moved up to what was never on Sunday in Dania Beach. That became Casa Bella. Um, they used to have a, a dish called veal capachosa mm. and veal capachosa was this end chop veal chop and they pounded the living daylights out of it. Flour, egg, breadcrumbs. Veal capachosa. Yeah. yeah. And it was just a little, little Chianti. Mm. And we would drop that into a fryer, literally cook in about five to seven minutes, pull that out. And then we topped it off with arugula, tomatoes, olives, onions, celery, garlic, salt, pepper, aged balsamic and aged uh, really nice uh, extra virgin olive oil. I haven't made that dish, man, it's got to be three, f- at least six years. I haven't made that dish. Well, you're going to be making it again. So, Cause it was, it was, it was, it hit <laughs> the mark. John's favorite besides the orange. Well, yeah. I mean, it hit the mark for me. Yeah. There's, there's, there's so simplistic. Well, you know I mean? You're, we're talking about Jeff here. Yeah. yeah simple. Yeah. Simple. Jeff. Simpleton. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Um, at, least at least I'm not a cretin. Yeah, that's true. That is true. So listen, on, on one of our socials, um, uh, yes, a, a Miss uh, Robin McDonald uh, reached out and she said, wow, that, uh, that Monte Cristo, right? Mm-hmm. And she actually was asking for the recipe on how to do the creme brulee, you know, for the, for the batter, for the bread. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I just wanted to bring that up and, and, you know, put her name out there for, for doing that. Because I, I just feel like, you know, we're, we're finally coming into a place where there's a lot of activity surrounding the food. Right. And I want to remind everybody that, um, we do touch a lot on the restaurant life and what goes on in the industry, but at the end of the day, a foodie is a foodie is a foodie. And, um, you know, it's just great that people are participating and I just love it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, here's another one to add to that. And we talked about it yesterday. A friend of mine called me and we had a very interesting, interesting conversation about the podcast. I don't, I don't know if you told John or not, but Daniel, Chef Dan, Daniel Ramos, mm. he had a restaurant in Del Rey. Uh, it was a s- sausage shop that made bone marrow broth and all this. And it was doing great. Um, had a little bit of disagreement with his partner, broke off. And then he's now... Uh, growing, he's a farmer, he's growing herbs and other different produce for a select few chefs in West Palm. And he was just telling me how it was, how to get into something, involved in something. His wife was saying, go listen to podcasts. He started listening to ours. And it was incredible to listen to how we impact the listeners out there that are actually really listening to us. And he's loving everything that we're doing with uh, the farmers too. Well, you know what? I probably, I think I met Jeff before. Uh, you know, way back when, when Daniel, was, yeah, I want to say, I, I'm certain of it. Yeah. Um, I, I think we had, there's two guys that were involved with the ACF Palm beach. There was Daniel Diaz and Daniel Ramos. I get the two of them confused. Well, here's the, here's the, here's the deal, right? You people, right? Chefs, non-chefs, whatever. Um, reach out every now and again, you know, throw a post up or a like or whatever. I know there's a lot of listeners who they listen, but they don't participate, participate. You know, it helps us in gigantic ways. Um, so just, uh, we appreciate every, everybody for tuning in and, 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 uh, following along. I All will, right. I will wait before we get to the guests. I will say that this stuff that we're doing with the, the retro remixes with the hungry man that I posted, <laughs> my yeah. God, yeah. Oh, <laughs> for sure. that's a hit. Then we, cause we get the most responses out of that. Yeah. You know, what we got to do, uh, what is it? Uh, here's what I want you to do. 
Figure out how to do a, a bacon toaster strudel. How about that? That's not hard. I don't care if it's hard or not. Make it your way because it's delicious. I, I just want to have that. <laughs> this is before, before my, I have a doctor's appointment, you know, to check me out. So I want to do it before then this way because I'm probably going to get locked down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, I was called for a TV show that was going to do a, a, a centric bacon, centric dishes. Yeah, I know you. I, I don't know how many times you told me about it already. You think I forgot? Yeah, but I'm not. This, what are you going to do, bacon? That's not been done before. I'll slap you. What are you talking about? They wanted the bacon as the shell of a taco or the, the bread of the grilled cheese. That's okay. been done before. So do it again. It's bacon. What are, you, what are we talking about here? Now, I got to do something. Got to oh amp it up, God. man. You know, well, it's me. Fi- f- figure it out. I got a chemist to my left. Man, it's true. To me. <laughs> <You> gotta, <laughs> wow. gotta, the mad scientist and the chemist. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we have, we have a uh, an in-house guest uh, who's just listening, not on the show today, just listening. But um, he did a great job on that video. How about that? When are you going to post that? He's still working. He's working on it right no, now. No, the one you showed me. Yeah. He, oh, he's still so working Evan, on that. Yeah. Evan is actually still doing like some color correction and he's, and he's you know, making sure that the- uh, He's making sure you look, look good. Yeah. <laughs> he's slimming me out and everything. Um, no, he's making sure that, uh, you know, all the sponsor logos are, you know, proper, big and, you know, that whole thing. Um, anyway. All right. So with that said, uh, let's, uh, let's usher in our guest today. Uh, Mr. Matt Haynes, the author, Mr. Matt Haynes. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. How are you two? Man, you know, if I was any better, if I was, in- if it was any better, I don't know what I would do with myself. How about you that? Mardi Gras? Oh man, I wish, <laughs> I only wish I was in Mardi Gras right now. Tell you what. It's getting started. I can hear it and see it outside my window right now. People are starting to, are, are dragging their kids in little push carts down the uh, street toward the parade that's starting a couple hours. It's crazy. Oh, there's actually a parade today? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's parades. Gosh, there's parades tonight, tomorrow, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, uh, Monday night, and then all day Tuesday. Um, so it's the last kind of stretch here. You know, I mean, it's that's got to be amazing. I, I I never did Mardi Gras, but I did do New Year's uh, New Year's Eve in uh, New Orleans back in '92, yeah. and it was just like wall to wall people having like the best time ever. It was a pretty amazing experience. It was cold, but you didn't notice it, and it was really you know John was at you were there, we were there. Together. Yeah, that was really great, man. That that was a wonderful experience. I have to assume Mardi Gras is like New Year's multiplied. Yeah, probably in times like 15. I love New Year's here. Um, but a lot of people have this idea that Mardi Gras, you know, you see all the, you hear everything about the, you know, throw me some beads and then lift up my shirt or whatever. Um, but uh, that's like a very specific, small, if you're down in Bourbon Street kind of situation. But like up where I am, it's like a miles long block party where people are definitely drinking a little bit too much, but not a lot of too much. And people are grilling <laughs> out on the neutral ground and stuff. It's really fun. It's awesome. What area do you live around? In New Orleans or Louisiana. Uh, lower Garden District. Beautiful. So uh, close to like, uh, you know, Magazine Street, if people are familiar with that, um, kind of in the border of Lower Garden District and Uptown. Where well, it goes, it's a few blocks for me. For the record, I'm getting to an age now where, you know, um, people should be throwing me the beads. Because <laughs> they, they don't want to see it. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to see it, but I'm getting to that point now. I got I to gotta start doing some push-ups or something. I don't know. All, All right. right. All right. Me too. Exactly. All right, so um, Matt, why don't you? Can you do me a favor just for the for the uh, for the audience? Why don't you do like a you know airplane view of of who you are, what you got going on, and how you landed in uh, in New Orleans, and how you I don't know how you you fell into the world of king cake. Sure, I, I would be happy to. So uh, um, I am from New York originally, um, which people in New Orleans kind of gasp, like, why did this guy from New York create this book about king cake? Uh, I've been here for 15 years, though. But uh, yeah, I was a, a, a classical trombone player was my background for a long time and uh, ended up doing arts administration, which then turned into more generally nonprofit management, went to grad school for that. And I uh kind of was splitting my life between teaching these marching bands in Asia. I am a, uh, a Japanese mas- uh, national marching band champion. Um, nobody asks to know that, but it's, uh, it's a fun fact. <laughs> and, uh, and then I was um, uh, going to grad school for nonprofit management. I ended up getting an internship in New Orleans uh, 15 years ago. 
thought I'd be here for two months and then ended up staying uh, here. I am, like I said, 15 years later and uh, not involved in writing, not involved in king cake at all. Um, at that point, uh, now I'm, uh, I kind of, you know, 15 years later, I split my time between writing, um, books about King cake. And right now I'm working on a book about po' boys as well. Um, a new Orleans famous new Orleans sandwich. Um, and then also being a journalist. And so I've written some articles, um, a lot of food articles. So I wrote one uh, about Mardi Gras food traditions for the New York times. I write a lot of travel stuff for lonely planet and photos. Um, I've written it for Zagat and uh, CNN and uh, all sorts of stuff. So that's kind of how I split my time. Uh, but you asked about, you know, how I got into uh, to King Cake. Um, for a lot of people um, who are not from here, they can maybe relate that King Cake doesn't seem that impressive on the surface. It's kind of like, what is this weird looking cinnamon bun sort of? And um, my first eight years or so in New Orleans, I was, um, you know, just uh, I'd see it on the parade route. You're going to go out to the parade route. You're always going to have a table there. There's going to be beer on the table. There's going to be um, fried chicken on the table from Popeye's. And there's going to be um, some king cake. And the king cake is the least impressive thing a lot of times if it's coming from a grocery store or something like that. And so I was like, what is this? And then uh, one year I got invited to a king cake party which is this idea that everyone brings their favorite variety and then whoever brings the best one, there's a vote at the end and they are crowned champion and uh, get a prize. I am a very competitive person. So I wanted to win. I didn't know what was the best king cake though. So I just Googled it and I found a top 10 list from a local food writer here. Um, again, this is before I was writing. And so I just put those 10 onto a spreadsheet and I figured I'd try them. But then I noticed there was another uh, article just below that, that was like top 25 king cakes. And those 25 were different than those 10. So I was like, oh, shoot, I guess I have to eat these 35 king cakes now. And uh, pretty soon my list was over 140. And I tried in the end 88 that season, uh, which is basically all I ate for six weeks was was king cake exclusively and uh, managed not to gain too much weight. Um, and then I uh, left to go hike the Appalachian Trail shortly after that, which doesn't sound like it's related to King Cake, except uh, for those six months, everyone gets a, a trail nickname. Um, and some of them would be like, uh, I don't know, Jackrabbit or Roadrunner or something that sounds fast. And my trail nickname was King Cake. Um, and so literally for, for six months, I was just called King Cake. And then I uh, got back to New Orleans and started writing. And uh, every year when I wrote about King Cake, those articles did better than anything else. And so I figured maybe I should write a book about this. And turns out uh, nobody had written a book about it before. So that kind of gave me the courage to give it a whirl. And that's how the big book of King Cake came to be. So just before we get into any questions or anything, um, yeah. the, the fact that you did six, I can appreciate and identify uh, with <laughs> six <laughs> six weeks of, uh, of, of eating nothing but uh, King Cakes. And you would need a six month sabbatical, you know, walking uh, odyssey to. Do you better watch it because that's what your doctor's going to tell he's you. Gonna tell you go that he's going to tell me that He's going to say, "Look, here's, I don't know who this Jeff guy is, but you stay you away." Got from nine him. months to <laughs> go on the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> stay, stay away from him and, and start walking. Like, just don't stop. Just keep walking until you hit water. Right? Yeah, I get, I get you. Um, all right. So, the, so the king cakes. And by the way, I, I before meeting Pooch. Uh, River, Rivera, uh, I'd never heard of a king cake. I had no idea what that was. And um, mm -hmm. so that that's point number one. And when, when he started talking about, hey, you know, um, you should talk to, to Matt and, you know, he's doing this with the book. And, and I started looking into you a little bit. The photography is beautiful. These king cakes are amazing looking. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking that they all taste a little different because they're, they're all made differently. Even though there's a, uh, a similar build to them, they're all different and it's, it, it's, it's seemingly amazing. So that's point number one. And and then point number two is I've never had a po' boy that I liked. And I, and I know that that hurts a lot of, I, yeah, I've always had, I've never been happy with any of them looking at, uh, at I'm gasping. I know it's, uh, I'm, listen, I'm just, no, you should have seen my face. Everybody's that's, gasping. That's, that's what it, you should have seen. I, uh, I've been unlucky. <laughs> I've just been unlucky, but I will tell you, I saw images, um, you know, from what Matt was kind of doing with these. Wow, man. I mean, I'm, I want to, I actually have some, uh, not with me, Jeff, but I'm going to show you some and I, and I want you to reproduce because <laughs> they're, they look phenomenal, phenomenal. And I want to change my mind. Right. All right, Matt. Um, 
All right. So t- talk about the differences in these cakes, man. And kind of, and you were going to, okay, there's a couple of things that we're going to talk about folks. Um, number one, uh, Matt's going to do a little uh, touch and go on the history of King cake, which um, is actually fascinating. And, and also um, he's got, uh, and he's going to explain it, but when he started his search in King cake, he realized that the the stories of the people who actually, you know, are, are baking these cakes are remarkably interesting. So he's going to get into some of those and the history and uh, Matt, go ahead and take it away. Yeah. So I think uh, probably I should, I probably should have started with this at the very beginning. Like some people might be listening and being like, what is a king cake? Like, what are you even talking about right Correct. now? Like, Carl. Don't belong yeah. Together. yeah. <laughs> and so I'll start with a king cake is eaten during what we call in new Orleans carnival season. Carnival season goes from January 6th, which is the 12th night of Christmas and it lasts all the way until Mardi Gras Day or Fat Tuesday. And um, some people call Twelfth Night of Christmas Twelfth Night or Epiphany. So that's the starting period. And then Fat Tuesday or Mardi Gras, that ends the season, and it's a moving day based on when Easter is. It's the day before Lent starts. And, um, and you know, so during this window of time, New Orleans is – for large parts of this is almost completely shut down. Like you can't even drive around the city right now. And uh, people are eating too much and drinking too much. And, um, and we have people are eating these cakes, these king cakes, and they are ring shaped. Um, imagine it, they look like uh, you know, they're oval, not circular oftentimes. And they are uh, much bigger than a donut. You could probably get like 32 pieces out of it. So they're, pretty decently sized and they have um, oftentimes a brioche dough um, or maybe could be a cinnamon roll dough or a pastry dough. And um, cinnamon is uh, the main flavor nowadays inside the cake. And then there's an icing on top. And then on top of the icing is oftentimes purple, green, and gold sugar. And those purple, green, purple, green, and gold are historically the colors of Mardi Gras um, people always wonder what they those colors stand for. Um, the crew of the main crew that um, kind of introduced the city to those colors, crew of Rex, they say that purple is meant to be um, royalty, um, gold is meant to be power and wealth, and green is meant to be faith. And so those are the three colors of Mardi Gras you see. And people are, right now, I can look out my window and I see a three-year-old being dragged down the street in his stroller with a purple, green, and gold shirt on right now. And so the colors are everywhere. And um, and so this cake has a little, probably most famously, has a little plastic baby hidden inside the cake. You don't know where it is. And as the party's going on, whoever gets the slice with the little plastic baby is crowned king or queen of the party. So there's a good, again, it's kind of meant to be, you know, prosperity and good good fortune and stuff like that. So you're crowned king or queen of the party. Um, and you're also responsible for, for bringing the next cake to the next party. Or like, so truly, without exaggeration, 90 or more percent of classrooms in southeastern Louisiana um, on Fridays. Well, somebody will be responsible for one of the kids brings a king cake into school. Whatever kid gets the baby inside that cake is uh, gets a crown, is crown king or queen of the classroom, and then their parents um, are buying the next cake for next Friday's thing. It's in every you can't go into a New Orleans. Uh, office where you go into the break room, you'll find three or four king cakes in there throughout all of carnival season. Every party you go to is going to have king cakes. We have, um, I think they say that more than about a million king cakes are sold in New Orleans every carnival season. Um, there's places that now pop up where, um, like little king cake hubs, where they'll have 40 different bakeries bring their king cakes to one central location uh, so that you, it's like a king cake mall, basically, like king cake mania is uh is growing every single every single year and so that's basically the tradition as it stands now um and then we can kind of move on to where that idea came from but uh well that's what i was that's what i was just gonna say um because to me this is fascinating because this is something i've never heard of and it's such a like a million freaking king cakes but and you said you were telling me uh you know what they do for lent they don't eat cake (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. well, get in now. so you you were mentioned you mentioned that uh this goes all the way back to rome
Attention chefs and food buyers. Are you looking to improve your proteins program with quality and service by the best in the beef business? Reach out to Peninsula Food Service. With 25 butchers on staff, their services will dazzle you and impress your dining guests. Peninsula is the largest Creekstone farm distributor in the Southeast United States. Let the gang at Peninsula Food Service cut your beef burdens away and ask about their dry-aged program. Look them up at PeninsulaFood.com. Yeah, yeah, it starts all the way in ancient Rome. So a lot of people here think it goes back to France because we were settled by the French originally. Um, but thousands of years ago in ancient Rome, uh, they were celebrating the Saturnalia Festival. And so the Saturnalia was a multi-week festival around the winter solstice. So December 21st was kind of the central point. And um, uh, what they were celebrating is that... Um, so on the winter solstice, it's the uh, the longest night of the year, basically. The sun rises the least high in the sky on that day, which doesn't sound worth celebrating. Uh, but basically, they're acknowledging that, hey, we made it through the worst. The worst, the longest nights behind us. Uh, springtime is off in the horizon, but it's coming because winter, you know, back then, you're afraid of starvation or freezing to death. And so, hey, we got something to look forward to now. The past is behind us. Every single day from here on out, the sun is going to rise a little bit higher in the sky and the days are going to last a little bit longer. And the Romans literally believed that this was like the return of the sun, uh, return of the S-U-N, which is interesting because Christianity, they talk about the return of the sun, S-O-N, probably not an accident. Um, and so they would have um, this festival and people who are familiar with Mardi Gras might recognize the way that they celebrated back then. They would celebrate by dressing in colorful costumes. They would um, parade in the streets. Uh, they would, uh, schools and courts would be closed. They'd eat too much. They'd drink too much. And then they had this cake that was round like the sun and golden like the sun. And instead of a baby, they had a, a fava bean hidden inside the cake. And whoever got that fava bean was crowned king or queen of the Saturnalia festival. And instead of buying the next cake, um, they were actually oftentimes sacrificed to the gods. So it was uh, much higher stakes to get the uh, the bean than it is now to get the baby. Um, so, yeah. It's a, a, so now, uh, yeah, well, now you, they've ended that, yeah. you get the baby now, it's like you're a hero. Back then you get the fava bean and now you're getting thrown into a volcano or something. Or with a Chianti and liver <laughs> being eaten. Yeah, wow, my God. Right. Wow. But, but New Orleans, you know, some people, they don't want to have to buy that next cake. And I remember back when I worked in an old job, uh, I walked into the break room and there was a guy just stuffing the baby back into the cake because he didn't want anybody to know that he had gotten it. And that is, if you're a Louisiana, that's probably the most shameful thing you could possibly do. Um, and I want to be like, dude, it could be much worse. You could have been sacrificed to the gods. Just buy the next cake. It's okay. Wow. Um, and then. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they're, so, they're serious. You want to talk about like a subculture? Well, I, I worked with a girl from Louisiana, uh, Christy Schaubert, and, uh, I remember we were in, in Palm Beach and she bought this, somebody shipped the king cake and I got the baby and boy, I didn't hear right. the end of it. Oh, you got to buy the next one, <laughs> chef. You got to do, I'm like, all right, whatever I need to do. That's fine. But I had already heard about it cause I lived in New Orleans, but yeah, king cake is yeah. just one of those things, man. It's, you know, when you're describing about Rome and the ancient like history behind the king cake and everything, it almost sounds like when in Venice too, when they did the, 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 the mask and the carnival from them as well, but it's a little mm -hmm. bit different. And so I guess that's where it kind of got stemmed from the Romans, all that whole stuff. Yeah, with the carnival. So, so many things. Yeah. So many things stem from the Romans. Um, and then like when Roman, when, when Roman empire obviously expanded from the British Isles in the West to Bulgaria in the East, and they brought all their traditions with them. And so this idea of during the Saturnalia festival, having a cake with something inside it, um, got reached all these places. And when Christianity eventually took over Rome and Christians, uh, smartly decided rather than getting rid of those pagan customs that they'd merge their traditions with them. Um, they put on on top of the the biggest Roman festival of the year, Saturnalia. They put their biggest festival of the year, which was the birth of Christ. And you know, historians will say nobody's a hundred percent sure when Jesus was born, um, and so they had room to play with when they were going to celebrate his birth, and they just put it right on top of that Saturnalia festival. And um, we think now of Christmas as being this, um, you know, one day or 
Christmas Eve and Christmas Day kind of event, but we all also know that there's the 12 days of Christmas. And so um, the 12 days of Christmas on the 12th night, um, Christians believe that um, the three kings found baby Jesus and presented their gifts to him. And, uh, and Christians around Europe uh, commemorate that by eating a three kings cake or a king's cake. And now we call it a king cake. Um, and so a lot of Louisianians think that New Orleans or Louisiana is the only place with a king cake. But you can look at many, uh, eight, ten different countries um, that I can think of off the top of my head around Europe and Mexico as well that um, that have a version of this king cake or cake of kings, depending on the language that it's being translated from. That's pretty amazing. That's what, that's under Constantine, right? That would have been uh, 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 the uh, yeah, Emperor yeah, Constantine, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yep. As the ideas started to spread and turn into a kind of a Christian thing. And, and uh, I was mentioning the shape of it being uh, kind of ring shaped, uh, an oval with space in the middle. And a lot of people think, hey, maybe that's because it's meant to be a crown. And we have colorful sugar on top, but a lot of other countries have like colorful candied fruit on top, which maybe people suggest that could be jewels of the crown, for example. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it's all meant to celebrate these, uh, uh, the, the three kings. And all of these king cakes are made differently. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of photos in the book, obviously to kind of show. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, there's some similarities because they tend to be in, in colder, you know, not obviously Louisiana is not cold, but places that have a decent winter and especially in Europe, that's the case. And so, um, there's a lot of times there's kind of like either brioche with a little bit of like some sort of liqueur inside it um, or a fruit cake with some icing on top of it. But they, yeah, there's differences, but most of them are ring shaped and all of them have something hidden inside it. And then there's that idea of good fortune. Um, if you get that something inside it and then uh, hosting the next party or bringing the next cake or something like that. But is um, it actually Bulgaria good fortune for, or, or yeah. is it looked at not? Because you said the, the, uh, the one fellow like stuffed it back in. He just didn't want to buy it. Yeah, so I think that (laughs) it's interesting. I think that nowadays, like people get kind of uh, the biggest thing that people think is uh, of now is that you have to buy the next cake. Um, And so maybe that doesn't feel very lucky. But there's this whole other component that definitely when you talk to like little kids, they want that baby so bad because that means they're getting the crown. They're the king of their queen. They're being celebrated and special. And so I think as we are become adults and we have to uh, get to pay for things, uh, maybe maybe people see it as less fortunate, mm. or or the real thing is is it's you're bringing dessert so people come together, so you're sitting around the table. Yeah, you know, so it's yeah, all about family. Yeah, yeah, and you get to bring your your favorite cake and introduce that to people too, which is a nice thing. Uh, so, so what be... what are the most unique cakes that you've run across? Bacon. Yeah, so, yeah, there's so many. And so the, the big book we start, there's a lot. When you guys mentioned earlier, uh, what can you do that's different with bacon? I thought of like three or four different king cakes that exist that uh, have bacon in it. Uh, but there are, God, it's endless. So the um, the way the big book of king cake is set up is it starts with very traditional um, Louisiana king cakes and then gets pretty wild by the end. And so um, I had mentioned earlier that cinnamon is a really common flavor. And then basically over the last three decades, every baker is looking to put their own little twist on what a king cake can be. And sometimes that's ingredients from places that they came from. So for example, a Honduran bakery that's putting guava and cream cheese in their king cake. Um, It also might just be ingredients that are important to um, that business or something. And so for example, the Audubon Insectarium here uh, puts, has a cricket king cake uh, that they make. Um, That's hilarious. And yeah, right. A lot of people say that it's uh, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't my favorite either. Um, Japanese restaurant makes a sushi king cake. Um, let's see. There's a woman who's got a, wait, 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 stop. Back up. Sushi, like, like raw fish is the top of the rice or is it like a dessert? So they make kind of, they mold rice, um, into an oval shape, big oval shape. And then they put some like crab cream cheese filling, um, you know, like in the middle of the rice. Uh And then it's beautiful. What they do, the topping is um is i mean what they try to keep as close to the three colors as they can but they just put all sort of different kinds of uh you know uh sushi or sashimi on top with um you know different sauces and stuff like that to make it look very very beautiful it's a really nice looking so it's like a a ring of sushi then right yeah it's like a ring of sushi exactly right a a big ring of sushi (laughs) that uh 
one person probably shouldn't eat by themselves, but I can get behind that. (laughs) Of course you can. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. It was delicious, especially after eating like hundreds of cakes for this book. Anytime somebody put a savory king cake in front of me, I was so, I was so for it. It was awesome because I had something to break up that sweetness was very helpful. Hmm. Hmm. I am. Uh, I envy you. I really do. Like this is your, what you're doing is like right up my alley. Um, so write a book. I, I'm going <laughs> to, all right. So I'm, uh, well, we're going to do a book. I, I There's going to be a walk and talk book and it's going to be about all the different, you know, we already have an editor. So I know. Yeah. We, we, uh, awesome. You know, he's shaking, he's shaking his head. No, not that one. I have another one oh, that well, can lay it out into the book form too. Well, that's what he does. Yeah. But it just, he was shaking his head. Oh. Would you stop doing that? Rank amateur. All right. So, um, all right, Matt, uh, let's reel it back in. You, you made the jump, um, when you were putting your book together and you, you told me, you know, I'm, I'm looking at all of the, it's going to be photography forward and it's all these beautiful pictures. And, but then you, then you realized, wait a minute, something that's even more interesting than the beautiful uh, photography and artwork is the stories behind the people who actually are, are making these things. Yeah. I was, uh, I was blown away. I, I really, I had no idea. Um, you know, I'm a journalist, so I know there are interesting stories. I didn't know, I did not connect how, how the cakes were so closely tied to the stories of the people who made them. Um, and so one example I can think of off the top of my head is, um, there's probably one of the most well-known King cakes in New Orleans now is called it's from a bakery called Dong Fang, and it's a uh, uh, um, they've won a James Beard Award. Um, they are um, uh, this Vietnamese restaurant, and in fact, today I went there to to interview them for a different story unrelated to King Cake, and so I was there at about eight o'clock in the morning, and there was it's going to sound like I'm exaggerating. There were 150 people in line down the, uh, the the major road that they're off of waiting in line to pick up their king cakes. That's how popular their king cakes are. Um, and so they they make, um, I think it's something like 4,000 of king cakes per day um, that they're selling. And uh, so I asked uh, Miss Huang Tran, and Miss Tran is the woman who owns Dong Fang. And I asked her to say, hey, how'd you come up with the idea of your king cake? Because they're a little contentious. Some people say, Oh, no, they can't be a uh, king cake because the shape's not completely um, uh, it's not completely connected and round. Um, and other people say, oh, you know, there's cream cheese instead of sugar icing on top. That can't be a king cake. Um, but I, I you know, how did you come up with this idea? And uh, her response was longer than I thought it was going to be. It was she said that, you know, her and her her husband and two kids um, were in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And her husband was a um, was a fighter pilot in uh, for the South Vietnamese, and he was shot down during the war and ended up in a prison camp, and um, and then he uh, managed to escape and got back to his wife and kids and said, "Hey, we got to get out of here now." And so they loaded everything they could grab onto a ship going toward Malaysia, and uh, on the way to Malaysia, pirates got onto the ship and uh, took everything that uh, that they had and everything that the other passengers had. And they ended up in Malaysia uh, in a uh, refugee camp for a year with basically nothing. And um, at that point, they learned that one of their friends from Vietnam had made their way to New Orleans, where there was this growing Vietnamese population in what we call New Orleans East, so kind of way out in the eastern part of the city. And um, he was able to sponsor them to come to the U.S. And so they got back on a ship a year later and made their way to New Orleans. And uh, again, Miss Tran said they had nothing at all um, except for each other, but they needed to make money. And so she was a seamstress back in Vietnam. And so she uh, tried her luck, kind of helping to sew things for people um, and made a little bit of money, but not enough to get by. And uh, then she remembered, you know, she's like, okay, well, my parents owned a cafe and uh, I learned a little baking there. So what if I, I don't see anybody making like these, you know, Vietnamese baked goods that we all love so much. So what if I started making those and bringing them to farmer's markets? And she did that. And she was able to save up some money and opened up her bakery, Dong Fang, uh, in 1982. And she said, you know, we're a bakery, but we have no interest in making king cake. By then, a lot of places were making king cake, but she's like, it's not part of our culture. Why would we do that? And so then fast forward a couple of decades when her grandkids are going to school and at school, like I was saying before, 
uh, every single Friday, there's a kink cake and one kid's responsible for bringing that cake and the not Vietnamese students, they were bringing king cakes, like really well-known popular cakes from like places like Randazzo's and Gambino's and Hey Dell's. These are all king cakes that people love here. And then when it was their turn to bring a king cake out in New Orleans East, there was nothing except for like a grocery store king cake. And so they'd bring them and they felt kind of embarrassed. And when they expressed that embarrassment to their grandma, she said, um, you know, like, why, uh, why don't we make a king cake that reflects our community's tastes and that our community can feel proud of? And so she made this, uh, the brioche dough that they use for so many other of their kind of very popular treats. And she says they send, uh, like, you know, tens of thousands of brioche products out around the city and the state every week. So these are like well-known, uh, products. And so she started with that dough and then because they didn't like, she said, we, being these people, we don't like you know, super sweet, sugary icing. And so uh, instead she decided to do a richer, more savory cream cheese on top. And um, and she said she was having a hard time making her dough bend um, because, you know, it's a different kind of dough, um, bend the way it needed to. And she remembered as a seamstress that if she cut slices into the fabric, it would help the fabric bend. And so she did the same thing. She cut slices into the dough and it created these ridges as it bakes. And people always wonder, like, why does Dong Fung's king cake look so different? What are these ridges for? And people think they're by accident, but none of it's by accident. It's all just a reflection of her own story and her family story, which I think is so interesting. That That is incredibly interesting. And, you you know, you always have to leave it to um, to a grandmother to be guilt tripped yeah. into, uh, you know, doing stuff for the kids. You know what I mean? It, and it started right. and it just so happened. It started <laughs> this whole, uh, you know, cultural shift, um, you know, with the, you know, with the population there in New Orleans. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. And, and, and yeah. what you, and the conversation we were having the other day, it just seems like there's an endless amount of stories like that. Yeah. It was the most, I, I feel so um, thankful to have learned this lesson that like, it, it sounds like something maybe I already knew, but to really see it in practice that everybody has a story, like truly nothing does, nothing exists that there's not a story behind if you'd ask, ask the right questions. And so as I started to realize that, and I asked better questions to the bakers, you realize that, okay, Dong Fang, that's a pretty good story, but all 75 of the bakers, they have reasons why they use certain ingredients or why they use no filling or why they, cause it's because it's either nostalgia to the king cakes they loved growing up, or it's the opposite, or it's the, this one uh, Cuban uh, Baker, she said her um, her aunt um, in Cuba would, um, for special occasions, make these um, like these amazing octopus dishes. And so this woman here, she has a a pop up, and so she said one time a month. Um, she wants to make an octopus dish for her customers. And so during carnival season, she makes this elaborate, kind of terrifying looking, but delicious uh, octopus king cake, which of course would never exist. And a lot of New Orleans would be like, that's not king cake, but I don't know, to me, who cares? It's like this incredible story and it's a part of her and it it takes the tradition to a place that it hadn't been before. That doesn't mean that it should replace those um, you know, those traditional king cakes, but it's fun to have all these different varieties and all these different stories. So you've had, uh, you know, hundreds of, uh, perhaps even more than that, um, types of, of king cake. Do you have, I mean, is it possible to even have a, a favorite, like a top five or even a top three? Yeah, I've got, I do have a favorite, a top five and a top three. And I knew when I did my first interview a couple of years ago, I'm like, people are going to ask this. And so I have to decide if I should avoid the question. Or, uh, or just be honest. And I decided to be honest. Obviously, I'm not saying my tastes are better than anybody else's. I just have preferences like everybody does. And so I don't know if people agree with me, but I, I do have, would, would you like my top one, my top three, or my top five? Three. Go three, baby. Okay. Three is the hardest one, actually. I shouldn't have included that. All right. I'll do three. So tartine is my uh, is my number one. It's um, uh, uh, cinnamon cream cheese. So So relatively basic as far as the kind of fillings you can have. Uh, that's got cinnamon cream cheese inside, um, and the, she just puts a lot of it in there. And it's, it's great. Kat. If you're in New Orleans, go there for anything, even if they don't have king cake. Um, just get to tartine because everything they make is so delicious. But our, uh, her king cakes, they she puts enough cinnamon cream cheese that as it's baking, it kind of expands out and busts through the dough. And you get these like caramelized cream cheese cookies almost mm. uh, that are so good. And she ships so you can get you can order it. And it's not an arm and a leg to uh Ship and order a tartine king cake either. 
Um, so that's one. Um, a number two, I think, would be um, a chocolate king cake from Bittersweet Confections. And so um, Cheryl Scripter owns Bittersweet Confections, and she said she grew up. Her and her sisters would make these uh, would make chocolates for, and she would love to make these chocolates, and then they would present them to their parents and see their reaction. She said her dad would always have this outsized reaction and be like, "Oh my God, this is the best chocolate I've ever had." And uh, so she said that gave her so much self-esteem and uh, she decided to become a chocolatier as she got older. And the chocolatier in New Orleans, probably going to make a delicious chocolate king cake. And so that's a great one. And then my number three, I would say, tough one. You know, uh, there's a place called Norjo's, an Italian grocery. And they said uh, one day they wanted to, they decided they wanted to uh, make a king cake that was reflective of their community. And so they made a cannoli king cake. Mm. So it's got a lot of their own homemade cannoli filling inside. And then on top, they put the different things you'd find on top of a cannoli. So like uh, the, you know, sprinkles, chocolate chips and uh, and pistachio um, on the top of it. And it is delicious as well. Yes, they please. Sandwiches I can, yeah, that. I can <laughs> yes, get behind please. that. You know, I've had so much, you know, being of Italian heritage. I've had my share of cannolis and I almost don't want to eat them anymore. Like I, like people, the what? Yeah. I, I really, I got like, I just kind of burnt out on cannolis, man, but I want your time. It's a good way to do it. Right. Well, that's what I'm getting at. Like, that sounds like a perfect uh, reintroduction uh, to it. Um, you know, you don't understand. Like you, you've had your, it's almost like you've had your fill. I had my fill. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's no, pretty- I, um, I'm from Long Island originally, and so while I'm Jewish, my family, I think we thought we were Italian, um, some sort of weird, like, Long Island Italian. And uh, so we ate a lot of cannolis. And I honestly, I, I mean, I think the, the filling is great. The shell is okay. It feels like it's just there so that you can hold the filling. Mm-hmm. Uh, personally, that might be sacrilegious to somebody. Um, but um, to me, the king cake, now putting the cannoli inside, the, the filling inside the king cake, uh it's an upgrade i think okay uh, so i want to be really clear it is because of the shell i just don't it's remember i mentioned before putting sugar on the ricotta Mm -hmm. i'll do that any day any old day well that's just part of a cannoli i get it right i love that part it's the the shell i'm over it just put the stuff in a a dish and i'll better it'd be a twill would be better because yeah. okay. it's lighter. Yeah, I can, I can. or bacon, mm. a bacon shell. Yeah, if I'm by myself at my house, I'm probably just eating that stuff with a spoon if it's here. That's what I'm, I'm saying. Like that. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Matt. You're picking up what I'm putting down here. That's what I'm talking about. Yep. Just give me this. <laughs> it's like Nutella. Nutella's great. I don't need to spread it yep. on bread. I don't need to dip a stick. Give me a spoon. Give me my container and leave me the hell alone. That's that's where I'm at with Nutella. I guess if we're in public, we have to. We can't just eat it with our hands or whatever. Ah, you know, hogwash. So we have to give. Hogwash. Yeah, just eat it. Eat it like. Right. Eat it how you want to. That's you know? why they have the Nutella with the breadsticks on the counter <laughs> in the Publix right. when you're walking, checking out. You know, think and you can eat it without your fingers. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. right. Um, yeah. I, so let me ask you this: When you're, so you have your top three. How yeah. often are you updating this list? I mean, it seems like because it doesn't seem like this was like a, a, a short stint in king cakes. This is you've kind of immersed yourself. In the king cake. So does that mean, yeah. does that mean that your choices change? I you mean, know, are you updating? Like when, when, when was the last time you did a refresh on this list? Just asking. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about it a lot, but it's, it's tough. because so I definitely have some that I run into every year that I hadn't had before. Um, this like last, just last night I had to, um, I think this will be funny because it's so insane that this even exists. We do these like cheese, wine, and king cake pairings now. Um, and so I um, try to get a lineup of five king cakes that then a, uh, you know, uh, um, experts on cheese and wine will then kind of pair with other things. And I try to at least mix in one that I haven't had before. Um, but it's tough. I, I have events almost every single night that is somehow king cake related. And there are just some that, when I'm telling their stories, I know their stories and I know what their king cakes taste like. And so they're kind of, if I'm going to be introducing them to 40 new people. Um, they're like safe bets, but then also like what you're saying, like I don't get to then try as many new ones as I'd want to, because every year there's dozens, there's, there's many dozens of new king cakes that pop up. Um, the number of king cakes that are, is, is growing like the year that I did a hundred and, or I had 140 different king cakes on my list, which was, five years before I did the book, 
that's like the, the, now there must be a thousand different kinds of king cake in New Orleans. It, what's it never the, end. What, what's the what's the dollar spent every year on king cakes? Do you know? I am not. It's a great question, but I am not sure how much. I mean, we could if we're saying there's a million king cakes being eaten in the New Orleans area. Um, and let's say that, you know, there's going to be some grocery store king cakes that are probably in the 19 or $20 range. But then most of the kind of better ones are going to be like 35 to $40 range. So I don't wow. know if we want to say it's a lot 30 of scratch. times. Uh, yeah, it's a whole lot of money. I think like. And remember, it's so- flour, water, <laughs> yeast. Wow. Right. Yeah. Though the There's, people who make the cannoli king cake, they say, I, I, this kind of got me thinking, is it, I mean, obviously inflation's happening, but then on top of that also, as king cakes are becoming more, as there's more unique varieties and those unique varieties are more like connected to the stories of those individual bakeries. If you're making a cannoli king cake, because you're a place that has kind of famous cannolis, then you're probably using really good ingredients and you probably want that to reflect in the king cake as well. So you're probably less willing to cut corners the way that maybe a grocery store is that's making like 30 different kinds or something like that. Or mass produced. So right. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe, maybe that's why the price is driving up a little bit more. I mean, that might be part of it at least. I'm not sure. It has to be really difficult to find a different one that's going to stand out in a place, especially in Louisiana and Orleans, because there's so many great restaurants there. Is that, could that be possible or? Yeah. I mean, I think for a lot of people, like there's one place that does, like I couldn't even rattle off the ingredients right now because there were so many, but it was kind of like Labna is on there and stuff. It's like this Middle Eastern mishmash of stuff and people are excited about it. I haven't gotten a chance to try it yet. I don't, no doubt it'll be good. Everything this restaurant makes tastes really good. Um, but like, I think in that case, it's the wild ingredients that make that king cake interesting. Um, whereas like I've noticed the, the, my favorite one that I found this year for the first time and my favorite one that I found last year for the first time, so two different cakes, both of them was because, wow, these bakers are just really, really good. And they just happened to move here recently, um, or opened a bakery recently in new Orleans. And so I think that's something that can separate people too. Sometimes it's just like, wow, the quality of this is so great. Um, so yeah, that helps some, that's a different way, I guess, as well, that it can stand out. So does this mean every restaurant in town makes their own, could, every could. one of them does, right? Hotels and, and uh, restaurants and whatnot, they, they kind of produce their own, um, you know, special king cake? Not, not every single one, though. I just get a talk at, at University of New Orleans and their, uh, their food department, they brought king cakes that they had made. So, so that university is making their own king cakes. Um, but I think there's a lot of, I'd say most, most restaurants do not make their own king cake. Um, there are plenty that do, um, but uh, and I think there's room. Like I'm looking right now outside of my house at a hot dog place. It'd be pretty funny if there was a hot dog king cake, uh, but they they don't make one. For example, I'd say every bakery certainly is making, or 95 percent of them are making their own version of king cake, and then many restaurants are as well. Well, I'm going to uh, I'm challenging uh, Jefferson here <laughs> to uh, produce a I've, king cake. I've already thought of one. I thought about doing like a pate choux and a ring. Uh, it's hmm. like an eclair awesome. almost. Yeah. And uh, piping it and then baking it off that way and then filling it in. So, yeah, but I've already started, like, the the brain started going. That's How long idea. is this going to take? Um, <laughs> the pet to shoe doesn't take that long. In other words, no, no, no. You're like, saying, I'm not doing it today. No, not today. <laughs> Can you? No. no. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, obviously, we are, uh, we're on a time crunch. Uh, well, I go out of town. I'm yeah. in. I'm in Austin for Fat Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately for me, not being in New Orleans. Yeah, but I'm back on Thursday. So if we do shooting on Friday, I can probably finagle. Okay, we're something. gonna we're gonna mess with this. Uh, and where are you going? On the, where, are you, where are you going? I'm doing uh, Austin. I'm going to go to Cater Source. I'm actually doing two presentations: one on plant based barbecue in the heart of Texas, and I'm doing another one on mental health. So. It's gonna be a good one. If they're gonna, they're gonna probably run you out with uh, pitchforks and torches. Nah, 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 the one I did uh, two years ago in Orlando was fantastic. In Orlando, they're embracing of such a thing. I mean, yeah, you go into the belly of the beast, man. Yeah, that's what I want. That's why I want to do it. All right, all right. Well, make sure you represent. Uh, oh, trust me, I will. Yeah. Is Turkey and the Wolf doing anything as far as the king cake? Because I mean, that dude is just—he's out there. 
Yeah. I mean, in a good way. So that's the um, Molly's Rise and Shine is one of his other restaurants. Right. They're the one that I couldn't remember the ingredients. It's kind of this wild uh, group of ingredients that it's kind of this one with like all these Middle Eastern qualities to it. Um, but if you go to, or I could just do it, go to Molly's Rise and Shine on Instagram, you'll find it, I think. And it's uh, it's probably the wildest of the year, I think, which is on brand for him. Yeah, um, but also, he's like said, just a really cool like, dude. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And his, uh, yeah. Some of my favorite sandwiches in the city are from, are from him. Yeah. There's um, also, um, I, Manish had Tava. That was a really good, great, great restaurant. I know it closed recently. His uncle owns Saffron. Is anyone out there doing that's from a different culture that you didn't expect? Like you said, Vietnamese, but you know, in Japanese, any other ones that's kind of out there that you've seen? Yeah. I mean, like there's uh, I think I mentioned earlier, this Honduran, uh, king cake with this guava and cream cheese. It's also a great story. He said, like, uh, you know, they were just like, ah, let's let's uh, let's just see if we can create our own king cake. And I hope people don't get too mad at us for for being a little too crazy. And uh, he made it, and it got in the news. And he said one day he opened up his bakery door, and there was a line around the building for people waiting for his guava cream cheese king cake. And it was really nice. He said that for years he had been enjoying Mardi Gras, but this was the first time he felt like he was really a New Orleanian because he was kind of adding to the celebration a little bit, yeah, uh, which is a cool thought. That is actually really cool. Um, yeah. And then um, let's see who else is doing. There's so many. There's a Brazilian woman making her own version of king cakes this year. Um, there is oh, um, Alan Jaya oh. from uh, uh, Saba. Yeah. He, uh, he makes a, a babka king cake. And so he grew up eating babka in Israel. He loves that tradition, like those traditions from home. But he also has fallen in love with New Orleans and the traditions here. And he said, rather than creating like just a traditional king cake, um, and competing with those, he said, why don't I just create one that kind of merges these two parts of my life? Um, I'm thinking, Jeff, I think you need to brioche. do a matzo. No, you need to. Do no, a, not matzo. You need to do a matzo ball. No, uh, oh, king cake. no, no. <laughs> come <laughs> on, man. <laughs> you know no, the baklava, I definitely would do bakla. <laughs> oh, sure. That one, that because it's brioche. Yeah. And then, and it's really, it's like, think about it. You get cinnamon in the, in the brioche and that's pretty much it. So now you're in, you know, uh, braid it, but no, that's, that's and genius. Jeff, Jeff, look at um, uh, look into a galette de wa, which is um, so galette uh, d e and then r o i s. Would you call um, me? It's like a French <laughs> version of king cake. Uh, <laughs> oh, and, uh, it's like that. That is like um, uh, a very popular French version of king cake. You'll see it definitely in Montreal. You see some of them in in big cities around the U S. too that have a French bakery, and uh, that's their version of king cake. And um, it is uh, they're very very delicious, and I bet there's some like fun takes you can do with that instead. The most common one would be almond frangipan inside there, but people are kind of messing around with different ideas as well. I had a chocolate one recently that was awesome. Well, so, let me, all right, let's, um, when you, um, how do we find your book? <clears throat> Good question. So you can go the uh, one way that I love is you can go to my, uh, my website at www.thebigbookofkingcake.com. That's one way, but you can also get it at a bunch of bookstores and, uh, what's your Instagram handle? Oh, sure. At the big book of King cake and, uh, at Matt Haynes writes W R I T E S. Matt, I think we're going to have you on again after, uh, after Mardi Gras and, uh, let's, we'll reconnect and and we'll catch up. And I want to thank you for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'd love to talk more. Absolutely. I, I want to just do a quick thanks to, uh, you know, Pooch Rivera. Again, he comes through in the clutch with these these, these great uh, contacts and terrific interviews. Um, John, as always, you're fantastic, mostly. Uh, he just Jeff, doesn't I mean, stop Jeff, talking. I know. He's, he's awesome. Um, I, and listen, I appreciate everybody coming out. Evan, thanks for coming out today, man, and hanging out. Uh, we are out. Let me tell you about my friends over at Citrus America and their amazing juicing equipment. They're revolutionizing the way you enjoy freshly squeezed juice. 
They're at the best hotels, restaurants, and markets. Their mission is simple. Develop a unique consumer experience with on-premise juicing. Deliver healthy taste options to clientele and juice more faster. It's that easy. Citrus America supplies the highest quality juicing equipment and solutions in the industry. So whether you're a small business owner or a large corporation, Citrus America has the right juicing equipment for you. Find out more at citrusamerica.com. 